Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today was a very, very highly requested one from you guys. The 10 year anniversary of his disappearance and death has just passed, so I can definitely see why people are trying to get the word out about his case. It's such a confusing case and it's one of those cases where even after researching it to the best of my abilities, I still really don't know what to think. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion that is had after this case. But before we get into the video, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, GlassesUSA.com. As a lot of you guys probably already know, I love GlassesUSA.com and they've been a sponsor here on this channel for quite a while now. And that's because I love the brand. They've made my life so much easier. If you're anything like me who cannot see, then you know how expensive glasses can be and how much of a hassle it is to get them at the eye doctor. Honestly, it's been so long since I've actually had to go to the eye doctors to get my actual glasses. Obviously, I still have to go every year to get my prescription updated, but I don't buy glasses from the eye doctor anymore and it's made my life so much easier. You know how it goes after the appointment. They say, oh, pick out your glasses, see which ones you want. We'll discuss insurance, we'll discuss pricing. Haven't had to do that in a while because GlassesUSA.com has such affordable eyeglasses that I don't even have to worry about it. By cutting out the middleman, GlassesUSA.com offers prescription eyeglasses up to 70% off of retail prices. You can now shop for your prescription eyeglasses online without ever leaving your home, all at affordable prices. GlassesUSA.com offers over 4,000 styles of glasses and sunglasses, including in-home brands like Amelia E, which is the ones I'm wearing right now in their black color. And then I have the same Amelia E frames in a brownish color because I love this style and it's nice to have different colors to go with different outfits. I also have a pair of Amelia E sunglasses. As you guys can tell, I'm a huge fan of this brand. I also have their Muse sunglasses and Audito, which is what these ones are just some of their in-home brands. But they also have designer brands like Ray-Ban, Gucci, Oakley, and so many more. You can find any style and color that you can imagine, including specialty glasses like sports glasses, safety glasses, kids glasses, and so many more. With GlassesUSA.com, you can add any prescription to almost any frames, including sunglasses and blue light blocking glasses. They also have this really cool try-on feature, which I love, my boyfriend loves it every single time. We always go through a bunch of different frames and put them all on, see which ones we like best. But it's really nice because like I was saying earlier, instead of having to go around, try each pair on, see how they look on you, you can see how they're gonna look on you from your home before spending the money on them. Which is really helpful when you aren't exactly sure how it's gonna look on you. I for one am very picky with how my glasses look, which is why I always stick with like the same frames and the same kind of style because I like how they look on me. So without the try on feature, I would have no idea what to get. But of course, the best part is the price point. A complete pair of glasses starts at only $30 and free basic prescription lenses are included with every frame. It's so easy. All you do is enter your prescription online, place your order, and that's it. You're done. You can sit back and relax and wait for your glasses to be delivered right to your front door. Standard shipping is free on every order no matter how much you spend. And if for some reason you aren't happy with your order, you have 14 days to return it for a full refund, exchange, or 100% store credit, no questions asked. The exciting news is that if you head over to glassesusa.com by clicking the link in the description box below, you can get up to 65% off of your first pair, which is just such an amazing deal. Consider they are already so affordable. And if you liked any of the glasses that I showed or the ones that I'm wearing right now, those will also be linked down below. So again, make sure you click the link in the description box below and head over to glassesusa.com for 65% off of your first pair. Thank you again to glassesusa.com so much for continuing to partner with me on these videos. Sponsors, honestly, are a really big part of what keep this channel running, so thank you again to GlassesUSA.com. So with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the unsolved murder of Blake Chappelle. Blake Tyler Chappelle was born February 7th, 1994 to his parents, Melissa Becker and Michael Roper, and he was from the town of Sonoya, Georgia. Blake was described by a friend as being one of the funniest people he knows. Those who knew Blake said that if you were in a bad mood, he could always make you laugh somehow. He was very outgoing and always wanted to see the best in everybody. He loved the people in his life and his friends were so important to him. His mom described him as being a very affectionate and loving person. 
He was known to love playing Guitar Hero and had dreams of becoming a TV anchor or maybe even a lawyer. His mother said that he was always trying to figure things out and make sure things were fair for everybody. He also was known to love rap music and he loved being the center of attention. When he was only seven years old at his grandmother's wedding, he went out and karaoke a rap track in front of everybody. He was also such a softie at heart. He would bring in stray animals into his home and even stray kids. If someone's parents had locked them out of their house because they were out past curfew or something, Blake would bring the kids in, give them food, and then make them a place to sleep on the floor. But Blake was no stranger to hardships. His mother became pregnant with him with her boyfriend at the time who really didn't want to be involved in Blake's life. So Melissa had to make the decision to have him and then raise him on her own. Blake actually didn't meet his biological father until he was 10 years old, which is such a difficult thing to have to go through. It was said that his father tried his best to create a relationship with Blake, but obviously he missed the first 10 years of his life. So this was very, very difficult. He also lived a lot of his life in poverty. There was a period for about three months where he said that he didn't even have a place to live. Because of these struggles and just his personality, he became a bit of an entrepreneur. He would buy Monster Energy drinks and then sell them for a slight markup to the kids at school. He would also collect the tabs on the Monster cans and then would turn them into the Monster company. And then in return, he would get prizes, which he used to decorate his dirt bike with. Now, growing up in poverty and not really having a father for the first few years of his life, those weren't the only things that made Blake's life very difficult. So for a short period of time, Blake was living with his family in Clayton County. While he was living there, he had been dating a girl who also had a bit of a rough home life. Blake tried to do whatever he could to help her. He even let her stay at his house sometimes. But according to Blake's mom, she had a lot of problems with her parents, specifically her stepdad. There was an incident that happened on May 8th, 2011, where the girl ran off and then her stepdad came out looking for her. Her parents just had a feeling that she had run off and was trying to go be with Blake. Now, as a side note, when she did run away, Blake knew about all of this and he tried his best to help her in any way that he could. He told her to stop don't run away and to go back home. He was trying to do whatever he could to help her do the right thing, but she didn't wanna listen. She ran away from whatever was happening at home and she met up with Blake. So knowing this, the thing that happens next is very infuriating. So when the stepdad went out looking for Blake, he went to others in the area who knew Blake and basically told them that he was looking for Blake. He did that thing where he lifted up his shirt and then showed everyone that he had a handgun saying that he's looking for Blake, so basically threatening them into telling him where Blake is. Eventually, the stepdad did find Blake, and lo and behold, the girlfriend was with him. When he caught up with him, the stepdad started beating Blake. At the time, Blake was pretty small. He was only 5 feet 8 inches tall, weighing 120 pounds. The stepdad punched him in the face. There was one report that said he was pistol whipped, and then the dad pushed him to the ground because he was on his bike at the time. So he pushed him off of his bike and then started kicking him in the face and body repeatedly. After beating him, he grabbed his stepdaughter and threw her back in the car and then drove off. Of course, after this incident, Blake did stop seeing this girl. Obviously, Blake wanted to press charges against him for beating him, but instead of charges being pressed against a grown man who beat up a teenager, by June 1st of that same year, an arrest warrant had been issued for Blake for interfering with custody for, I guess, harboring his ex-girlfriend. He was 17 at the time, so legally he was considered an adult while his ex-girlfriend was 16 at the time, so she was technically still a minor. He went to jail for 16 days before being released on a $2,500 bail, and his pretrial hearing date was set for October 24th, 2011. So obviously it's very frustrating and annoying that a grown man can threaten and beat a teenager for seeing his girlfriend at the time with absolutely no consequences. Instead, a 17 year old is sent to jail for two weeks, has to pay bond and then has to go back to court. And nothing happens to the man that beat a helpless child 
I couldn't even believe that when I read all of this. After the assault, the threat of being beat up again was still there and Blake's mom was absolutely terrified for him. So that is when they decided to move away from Clayton County and move to Sonoya, Georgia to get him away from the area. His mom said that she wouldn't even allow him to have contact with his old friends from Clayton County because she didn't want to give them the opportunity to track him and figure out where he went. Also after this assault, Melissa said that she noticed some changes in Blake's behaviors. He started to have a problem with selective mutism, saying that whenever he got scared, he basically lost his ability to speak. He also started experimenting with drugs like ecstasy. However, when he moved to Coweta County, it seemed like things were sort of starting over for him. He had no problem making new friends, and he even had a new girlfriend. Being that Blake was such a social and outgoing guy, it wasn't a surprise that he was so excited for his homecoming at East Cauda High School on October 15th, 2011. He was so excited to spend time with his girlfriend, Ryan, as well as his group of friends. His mom, Melissa, remembers being so excited for him, helping him get ready and making sure he had the perfect black shirt with the perfect matching tie that coordinated with his girlfriend's dress. Blake took so long trying to find the perfect tie, searching through all of the different options options at Kohl's. She remembers that he even got help from the store clerk to make sure that he tied on the tie just right. He was so worried about picking out the absolutely perfect tie that he actually ended up being a little bit late. He went to his girlfriend's house that evening to take pictures before the dance and he was a little bit late to that. Her house was located on Avondale Circle in the Olmsted subdivision next to Welch Elementary School. By the time Blake's mom, Melissa, dropped him off at his girlfriend Ryan's house, again he was running late late, so he had to basically run in to take some pictures. Ryan's parents were trying to get as many pictures of the couple as possible before they left, so Melissa tried to get a hug from him before sending him off, but he was in such a hurry that he didn't turn around and he didn't give her that last hug. And unfortunately, this was the very last time that Melissa had seen her son alive. Ryan's mom, Shannon, was the one who drove the two to the dinner and the dance that night. At 5.30 p.m., she drove them to dinner and then picked them up again at 7 p.m. to drive them to the homecoming dance. After the dance, Blake begged his mom to let him stay the night at his friend Austin's house. Melissa was really nervous for this because this would be the first time that he had stayed the night anywhere since the incident where he was assaulted in Clayton County, but Melissa told herself to just have faith, put more trust into Blake, so she cautiously agreed to this. But she told him and she made herself very clear that once he gets to Austin's house for the night, because he did do a couple of things before getting there, but once he was there for the night, she told him not to leave his house for any reason, and he promised her that he wouldn't. After the dance, Blake and Ryan were picked up by Ryan's mom, Shannon, at around 10.30 p.m. She then brought them back to her house, so Ryan's house, to watch a movie and hang out for a little bit. At Ryan's house, Blake took off his black shirt because he had just been dancing all night, he was really sweaty, and he just wanted to take the shirt off because he was really hot and kind of gross from being sweaty all night. After the two watched a movie, Shannon then drove Blake over to his friend Austin's house to stay the night there. And again, Melissa knew about all of this. Melissa knew that he stopped at Ryan's house before going to Austin's. She knew that Shannon was driving him. Once Blake got to Austin's house, he texted his mom to let her know that he got there safely. Melissa asked him how the dance was, and he said that it was awesome. He said that it was the best day of his life and he danced all night. He even sent his mom videos that friends had taken of him dancing the night away. However, after getting to Austin's house, after only a few hours of being there, Blake decided to sneak out and go back to his girlfriend's house. Ryan had fallen asleep at that point, so he texted Ryan at around 2 a.m. to let her know that he was coming back over. And then after she got the message, she fell right back asleep. Then at the same time, he went into Austin's room to let him know that he was going to be leaving to go back to Ryan's house. Austin thinks that this was sometime between 2 and 3 a.m. He then walked the three miles back over to Ryan's house, which is about an hour walk, and he was wearing black pants and a white Aeropostale hoodie. Soon after, he got there and he climbed into her house by going through her bedroom window. Ryan believes that he got there at around 4.30 in the morning. Ryan said that the two had just laid on the bed and talked about the day, 
and then they had plans to meet up later again that day at around 11 a.m. to continue hanging out. Ryan recalls that that night, Blake said that no matter what happened to him, he would always love her. However, by 5.30 a.m., Blake was actually caught by Ryan's grandmother, who walked into Ryan's room unexpectedly. Blake immediately tried hiding under the covers as a teenage boy would, but her grandmother had already seen him, so she walked out of the room to go get Shannon to come into the room. So as the adults were gone, Blake basically asked Ryan, should I leave right now? And Ryan said yes. So again, as a teenage boy would do in this horrendously awkward situation, he kissed Ryan goodbye and he climbed back out through her window and went on his way. He started making his way back, walking the three miles back to Austin's house, still wearing the same black pants and white Aeropostale hoodie. As he was walking back, he was texting Ryan's mom, apologizing to her about him being in the home without her permission. He was texting back and forth with both her and Ryan, saying that he's sorry over and over and over again until Shannon told him that everything was gonna be okay. He was also texting Ryan about how cold he was as he was walking home. The last text that he had sent to Ryan was basically him saying that he was pulled over by a cop who asked him where he was going and then asked for his ID. In this text, he also mentioned that this was somewhere near a bridge. So the thing I wanna note about this is that the Georgia State Patrol say that they have no record of Blake being pulled over or ID'd. They said that it's standard procedure for an officer to call in whenever they make a stop and it's standard for them to ask for an ID. So normally they would have records of who they stopped when and obviously their identification. But they said that they have found no record of him being stopped. So I don't know if this was something where the officer just kind of saw him walking, said, hey, where are you going? Like, who are you? And then went on his way and didn't really make it into a report. That's possible. I wonder if they spoke to the police officer who did this, if anyone claimed that they were the one who stopped him or if anyone had said that they were the ones who did it. But either way, I've seen that there is no record of him being pulled over at any point. So later that morning at around 6.30 a.m., Shannon remembers waking up her husband to tell him that she just caught Blake in Ryan's room and he sort of just laughed it off saying those damn teenagers before rolling back over and going back to bed. Now, Shannon hadn't heard from Blake after that 5.30 a.m. text, so she went back into Ryan's room at around 6.30 to ask Ryan if she had heard from him, and she said no. By the time 9.30 a.m. rolled around, neither Shannon or Ryan had heard from him, so they were starting to get concerned. So Shannon went ahead and contacted Austin to see if Blake had ever returned to his house. Austin said that he looked around the house, but he didn't see Blake anywhere. So Shannon and Ryan immediately got into the car and they drove over to Austin's house. Obviously they didn't see Blake at his house, so they went ahead and they drove around for 45 minutes looking for Blake around the neighborhood, but they saw absolutely no sign of him. It was at that point that Shannon then called her husband to let him know that they couldn't find Blake anywhere. At some point, Shannon and Ryan stopped at a nearby BP gas station, which was located in Summer Grove grove and they showed the cashier a picture of Blake and he did say that he saw Blake at around 7 30 a.m. when Blake asked him what time the gas station opened. After he told Blake that it opened at 8 a.m., Blake walked off in an unknown direction. So I don't think it's actually been confirmed whether or not this was actually Blake. It was pretty out of the way for where we think he would have been walking between the two houses so I don't know if it was really him walking there. Plus, I don't think it would have taken a full hour to get there based on what we know about the timeline, but we'll go more into that later. So Shannon then went to go pick up Austin and then met her husband, Matt, in the woods to start searching for Blake at around 11 a.m. Shortly after 11 a.m., Austin spotted a Noonan police car and then it flagged it down to let them know that they were out searching for Blake. So when obviously they still couldn't find him by 11.30 a.m., that officer called Melissa, his mother, to let her know that they could not find Blake. Of course, this immediately set off red flags for Melissa, so she wasted no time, and just before noon that same day, she called the Noonan Police Department to report Blake as a missing person. Police, as well as Melissa's boyfriend at the time, met up with Austin and Matt to continue searching for Blake in the woods. Now, police did take his disappearance seriously, and they searched really hard for him but both police and Ryan thought that due to some personal issues that Blake may have had, 
that maybe he ran away. So it almost seemed like, yes, they were taking this disappearance seriously, but as they were searching for him, it feels like they were sort of going off of the assumption that he ran away, maybe he got hurt, maybe he was somewhere out in the woods, something along those lines. He did have that upcoming court date relating to the assault that happened in Clayton County, but according to Ryan, he wasn't really concerned or nervous about it. She was gonna go with him to this hearing and they had talked about everything. But still, in the back of Ryan's mind, she thought that maybe he was more worried about things than what he let on, and she really did think that it was possible that he just ran away. For a while, she was really, really upset. She was kind of under the impression that he just ran away and he just left her. But nonetheless, they continued searching for him. And as time passed, they realized that he probably didn't run away. Especially as Thanksgiving was approaching, they really believed that something must have happened to him. One very strange thing that happened while Blake was missing was about five weeks after the disappearance, Melissa received a very strange phone call from a blocked phone number. When she answered the phone call, nobody said anything. She could hear a TV in the background or maybe news in the background that was playing on the TV. The person on the phone just sat there for four or five minutes just sitting there letting the TV play. Melissa kept saying, Blake, Blake, but no one said anything. Melissa described just feeling so very hopeless at this time and she really felt that whoever this was had to be the person that was responsible for his disappearance. Other than this, despite the searches done, not a single shred of evidence was found until December 19th, 2011. There were a few passerbys walking through an area in the Summer Grove residential area when they noticed what they thought was a body in a shallow creek called White Oak Creek that runs alongside the neighborhood's golf club near Summer Grove Parkway. And immediately, they called police. When police arrived, they saw the body of a young man laying face down in the water, wearing only an undershirt and underwear. No other clothing was found near his body, there were no weapons, and there was no form of identification near him. No phone, no ID, nothing. However, they immediately noticed that this young man had a lip piercing as well as a Playboy Bunny tattoo on his chest. This does match Blake's tattoo as well as the piercings that he had, so he was positively identified as the body belonging to that of Blake Chappelle. Upon completing the autopsy, it was discovered that Blake had died as a result of murder after being shot with a single gunshot wound to his head. He was in a state of decomposition when he was found. They weren't really able to determine whether he was murdered the day that he went missing or if he was killed at a later time and then brought to the creek at a later time. It was unknown exactly how long he was in the creek and it wasn't really known whether he was killed at the creek or somewhere else. It's been reported differently depending on what source you look at, but some sources state that he was in the creek for about three days, while Melissa reported that he was in the creek for up to a week. However, whether it was a week or as little as three days, that leaves a huge question. He was missing for two months before his body was found, so him only being in that creek for up to a week says that someone had either taken him somewhere and then kept him alive and then killed him shortly before he was found or he was shot somewhere else and then his body was placed in one spot and then moved to the creek at another time. Even though they weren't able to determine an exact time of death, they generally believe that his day of death was October 16th. I think this was based on the fact that there's been no activity on his phone after that day. The area that he was found in basically was in the middle of the three mile path where Austin's house was and where his girlfriend's house was, which would have been again about an hour of a walk. So where he was found would make sense for where he would have been walking to get from Austin's house to Ryan's house. He left Ryan's house at around 5.30 a.m. Then where he was found would have been about a half hour's walk away, which made sense why he stopped texting at around that time. Now, knowing all of this, of course, police were left with a couple of huge questions one of them being, how would anybody know where he was at this time? Who could have possibly known where he was or what he was doing? This wasn't a routine. This wasn't something that somebody would just know he was doing because he did it all the time. So they went ahead and checked his cell phone records to see if he had been in contact with anybody or told anybody where he would be. But the only messages that were found on his phone from that time frame 
was with Ryan and Ryan's mom. He hadn't been in contact with anybody else that morning about anything else. So over the course of the next few days, police continued on with their investigation. They even put out a $20,000 reward, which was the highest amount of reward money that they had ever offered. They did get some helpful leads and a lot of people seemed very interested in helping solve this case. They also continued searching in the area around the creek to see if they could find any bit of evidence. They said that they searched in hundreds of yards in every area from the creek, but they couldn't find anything. Before Blake left Austin's house that day to go over to Ryan's for the first time, so when he snuck out, Austin said that he gave Blake a jacket. However, Ryan said that she never saw this jacket. He didn't show up wearing it. He was only wearing that Aeropostale hoodie that we discussed earlier. This jacket that Austin apparently gave him has never been found and no one else has really seen it. They also haven't found his white hoodie or any of the other clothes that he was wearing. The only thing that they were able to find was the black shirt that he left behind at Ryan's house because he took it off when he went over there. They also have not been able to find Blake's backpack. Now, apparently he left the backpack at Austin's house when he left, so he did not take it with him. But Austin said that they were in the middle of moving when all of this happened, so he accidentally misplaced the backpack and he hasn't been able to find it since. So other than this, we don't really have any other information on Blake's case. Police have been very tight-lipped about the rest of the information even 10 years after his disappearance. They have yet to release any new information, so this is pretty much what we're left with. The overall questions obviously are who did this? because again, no one could have known where he was at that time. He didn't have contact with anybody other than Ryan and her mom that we know of from his cell phone records. So initially, police believe that maybe this was a random attack. Now, going back to what we mentioned earlier about the whole stepdad beating the crap out of Blake for pretty much no reason, I've seen it reported that the stepdad was looked into and he was cleared. I don't exactly know how or why or what went into this, but apparently they cleared him because obviously he would have been like the first person that they would suspect in this case. Honestly, I have no idea what to think. This does feel like something that is targeted. It just feels like that, but at the same time, my mind is going in circles because of how random all of this is. What could have possibly happened to make someone want to just shoot him randomly? makes me wonder if there was some sort of drug or other criminal activity that he stumbled on and was shot because he saw something that he shouldn't have seen. The only other reasonable explanation is that if someone who knows what he was doing was responsible. So out of the people that we know about, that pretty much just leaves Austin and then Ryan and her family. Someone could argue that maybe Ryan's family was angry enough with Blake for sneaking into their home without their permission that they did something to him. But I don't believe this. I think just based on their behaviors and how chill they seemed about it, I don't really want to entertain this because I just don't think that they're responsible for this. Shannon even said in a later interview that she should have never let him leave that night. She said she should have drove him in his car back to Austin's house and made sure that he got there safely. She was saying this through tears and through obvious sadness and regret and guilt. Overall, Ryan's family seemed very supportive of their relationship and I don't see any indication that they would wanna hurt Blake whatsoever. I don't really think any of this information points towards them. I don't feel like Ryan at least would be able to stay quiet this entire time. I don't know, there's just a lot of things about it that just really don't make me think that they're involved. But then I do wanna take a minute to look into Austin. Now, my ears perked a little bit when I heard that he lost Blake's backpack. Now, this can be taken and construed in multiple different ways. Now, I've seen that Austin and Blake had a little bit of a disagreement during all of this at some point, so it could be possible that maybe Blake did make it back to Austin's and then something happened once he got there. Maybe Blake did make it back to Austin's and then something escalated with this disagreement and then he was killed there and then dumped in the creek at a different point and then he hid the backpack to get rid of any of the evidence. Or what if there was another friend at Austin's house that night that had a problem with Blake? We can't really say. Again, it could be possible that if Blake got back to Austin's house that this friend had an issue with him and then killed him and everything happened from there. We honestly can't really say how this could have happened. 
because we don't really have any other information about Blake or anything else that really points towards him other than him losing the backpack. So I don't really want to spend too much time on this because as you guys know, I don't like pointing the finger. I don't like putting blame on anybody unless I have information. So these are sort of just thoughts that I have relating to especially the backpack. But again, there's nothing else that really points to him. I just want this to be something that we can consider. As somebody who has moved four times in the past year, I've lost a lot of my items. So I'm very understanding of how this backpack would have gotten lost. So again, not pointing fingers, just something to consider. The other possibility that I haven't really touched on yet is what if he wasn't even going back to Austin's house at all? What if he was either walking back towards his own home or decided last minute to go see another friend and was just gonna show up at their house without texting them? If this is the case, then I can definitely see that the person that was at the gas station could have been Blake. Because like I stated earlier, it was a little bit out of the way for him to go to that gas station instead of just going straight back to Austin's house. But if he wasn't even going towards Austin's house, then I can see why he would stop at this gas station. Me just being someone who, if I'm cold, I wanna get out of the cold as quickly as possible, I don't see why he would take the extra time to go to the gas station, even if he was like, I just wanna warm up, I just wanna get something to warm myself up. He's gonna spend more time outside by stopping somewhere than just going straight there and maybe jogging on his way back or something like that. Obviously, everybody's different and I'm just thinking of myself who gets cold easily and just wants to get to the next place as soon as possible, but maybe he did veer off and go to the gas station, I don't know but I do think it would make more sense that if he wasn't even going back to Austin's house, that he would go in that direction to go over to the gas station. Either way, if Blake really was going to a different friend's house, again, maybe because of this argument with Austin, maybe he just didn't want to see him again. If he really did go to this other friend's house and then had an issue with this friend, maybe something happened there. But again, this is all just a theory, so we can't spend too much time on it. It's Literally just a thought. These are just things to consider, different things that may have been going through his head, but we don't really know. And then again, going back to the assault that happened in Clayton County, some people think that maybe someone related to this incident is involved. Again, we know that there was an upcoming court date for this where he would be looked at with charges for interfering with custody. But the county prosecutor actually came out and said that since they know that he was trying to be helpful and was trying to get the girl to go back to her home, that they were going to drop the charges. The stepdad also eventually said that he would drop the charges as long as he never had to see Blake ever again. This can sound very bad, Obviously, if he never wanted to see him again, for real, for real, this could mean that he did something to make it so he won't come back, but I guarantee you Blake probably didn't want to go out of his way to see him either. So I do just want to point that out. I don't want that to be taken out of context. But Blake was trying to file his own charges for battery, so maybe with this upcoming court date, he was going to bring up these charges again and try to get these to go through and maybe someone in the family wanted to prevent that. Maybe it wasn't the stepdad, maybe someone related to the stepdad because the stepdad knew that he would be the first person they would look at. So he came up with an alibi for the time that he was assaulted or killed. It would make sense, obviously, if he had these previous charges with Blake, everyone knew that he didn't like him. It would make sense that he would try to get someone else to go kill him if he wanted him gone and come up with an alibi for himself so that he wasn't tied to it. Again, he was reportedly cleared for this, but we don't know the other situation around this. We don't know the details of how he was cleared or anything like that. But again, the thing that we keep coming back to throughout this entire thing is how would they have known that he was where he was at the time? How would they know that he was in this exact location at this exact time to target him and kill him? Unless he was being followed for a very long period of time and they were just waiting and they didn't take the opportunity the first time that he snuck out, that doesn't really make sense. I don't think that they would have followed him all this way. Plus, how would they know where he was to begin with? I don't know, none of that seems very realistic to me. I feel like they'd have to get pretty lucky for somebody, well, I'll say lucky, but they'd have to be pretty lucky to just randomly see him and decide that that's the time that they're gonna take their shot. Especially if Blake hadn't been into contact with them this entire time. If he had left them alone, hadn't tried to get back into contact with the ex-girlfriend or anything like that, I don't see any reason for them just randomly deciding like, now is the time we're gonna go kill him. But as I'm stating over and over and over again, 
even with all these things considered, how would they even know where he was when he was there? So in terms of somebody that he knows being responsible, I really don't know what to think. There are so many possibilities that we can consider that you know, seem like maybe they're pretty reasonable, but then we don't really have enough information to say whether they're realistic or not. The other thought, again, is that this was random. He stumbled on something that he shouldn't have and then was killed elsewhere and then was brought back to where he would later be found because, again, I don't think there was a sign of a struggle where he was found. I don't think there was any evidence in the area that he was found. And again, we know that he was not in that water for more than a week, according to the autopsy and according to the medical examiner. It's pretty clear, or it seems pretty likely, that he was killed somewhere else and then placed in one spot, and then his body was later brought to the creek where he would later be found. But given this, I don't know what else to think. I don't know where he was before this. I don't know where he would have been. I have no idea where he was even killed. And I don't know if police know that. Maybe they do and they just don't want to say it yet because of the integrity of the investigation or whatever. But other than that, we don't really have any other information to go off of. This is all just so confusing because he was gone for two months before he was found and he was only in the water for up to a week. So I'm just so curious as to what happened during those other weeks. Was he alive? Was his body moved? We really don't have any idea. As I stated earlier, this definitely has the potential to be a random attack. We have to consider that maybe he stumbled onto something that he shouldn't have, or maybe this was the case of a serial killer that was going through town and just happened to see him. With this case, there are so many possibilities and it's so frustrating that there's all these different things that we have to just keep thinking about, keep considering and tying all together. It's just really confusing. It's, it's really frustrating. So those really are the main thoughts and theories. As I stated earlier, and as I stated so many times, I'm so confused. I have no idea what to think. I'm really looking forward to hearing what you guys have to say because you guys always have so many good thoughts and theories swirling around your head that I never even thought of. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what you all think. Like I stated earlier, the police put out a huge amount of reward money for information on this case. So we know that the police are interested in this case. They do care. They do want to solve this case but still they have not released much about it. Yes, we need more eyes on this case, but if we want people's memories to be jogged and try to remember something that they've seen, we need new information. It's been 10 years and there has been more pressure. I've seen more articles being written about this case recently. So many people reached out to me and asked me to cover this case. Someone told me from the town that more people are continuing to talk about his case but even with that, we still don't have enough. We don't have enough information. Again, it's been 10 years. We need something tangible that adds to this case that just gives us another puzzle so we can think and think. And people from the area just remember something. Maybe they saw a random backpack. Maybe they saw something happen in an area that's not where he was found and they just didn't think that it was related. Any number of things that police could release that could just help people make that connection in their head can be helpful to solving this case. Again, I understand the integrity of the investigation. I know that there are some things that are very important to not release, but again, it's been 10 years. We need something new. Please just take a minute to share Blake's story. Keep this case alive. Keep people talking. Keep people paying attention to his case. John Lorden did an amazing video on him as well, and that will be linked below. I listened to a podcast and there's a couple of really great articles that have a lot of information which will also be linked down below. I just wanted to make sure that I got this case to anyone else that didn't see John Lauren's video or didn't listen to the podcast. I want to get this case out to as many people as I can. So again, please share his case, share his information, and just get people talking. This is a case that can be solved. I truly believe it. I truly believe that we will have answers, but we just need more eyes more brains on this case, more people figuring out and coming together and putting together the pieces. But either way, that is all I have for today's case. And now I'm really interested in hearing your guys' thoughts on what happened in this case. Let's discuss your thoughts and theories in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up. 
and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to head over to glassesusa.com by clicking the link down below to get 65% off of your first pair of glasses. Make sure you go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.